This veteran history project interview is being conducted at the home of Mrs. Lois Morris in Evansburg, Pennsylvania. The interviewer is Mary Lou Patrick, a librarian with the Cambria County Area Community College Library. Mrs. Morris is the widow of Mr. Hugh Addison Morris, a World War II veteran. Mrs. Morris, where was your husband born and raised, and could you relate some of his family and educational background? Uh, Hugh was <clears throat> born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but very shortly after he was born, he was brought back to Ebensburg to live at his grandfather's house with his aunts and his, his mother. And Our little town of Evansburg was founded by Hugh's great-great-great-great-grandfather. So he was very proud of his Welsh heritage. He was pure Welsh. And many years later that, that, that mattered to him. He was president of a little church where we hold a reunion once a year, and it it's, consists of all Welsh people. He was president for 38 years, very proud of the fact. Um, that's really how I met him, through that, uh, uh, my musical uh, playing for that church at the time. Um, the, he and his mother and his brother, he had one older brother, uh, the, the three of them moved to uh, Ligonier for a time. He went to high school there. And then they moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania, where he attended Allegheny College. He and his brother both attended Allegheny College. Uh, his, uh, his brother graduated there, but <coughs> Hugh didn't quite graduate there. He made it to within weeks of graduation and decided to follow his brother's footsteps, as he always did. And. Uh, his brother had joined the Navy, so he got into the Merchant Marine. I think there was some little problem with his teeth or something. He couldn't quite make the Navy, so he went to the Merchant Marine. Uh, which eventually ended up as a, a lieutenant in junior grade. Uh, he enlisted there. And was he, was he married during the war? Uh, his father lived in New York State and he, he met a woman there and married just at the beginning of the war. <coughs> and uh, of that union there was um, a son born and, uh, and a daughter. He had a son, uh, the son's name was John Lloyd Morris and the daughter is Karen Morris. These children are both in their 50s now. Mrs. Morris, uh, could you relate some of your uh, husband's wartime activities, please? Well, <clears throat> when I was going through his papers, which he preserved very carefully, I found this um, certificate of registry. And on it is his, that he was an senior assistant purser and pharmacist mate. Um, would you like to see the certificate? And what did he do, what did pharmacist mate, what were his activities there? Well, on, on the, uh, he was on the Liberty ships and they had, they had no doctors. They, um, the pharmacist mate was the closest thing they had to the doctor. So he would give shots for diseases and bandages, and aspirins for headaches, and whatever the, the fellows required without being a, a full doctor. Uh, he liked to do that because he had a couple of uncles who were doctors and chiropractors and whatnot, and, and he sort of enjoyed that work. And what did he do as a purser? Well, as a purser, I found lists of 
all of the, the shipmates because he he had charge of the, the, the pay. He paid every everyone on the ship. He was the he was the paymaster. So he enjoyed that too because of his training in college. He was a uh, he was a business uh, student in college, and he knew that kind of work too. So so his work suited him very well. He never was a sportsman. He wouldn't have been any good at firing a gun or anything of that sort, so I think the work that they chose for him was very well. Um, this was uh, another certificate I found in his papers, uh, issued by the United States Department of Commerce. It's a Siemens Certificate of Identification containing his picture and thumbprint. And this was very necessary when they went in and out of the ports. And he was in many different ports, as I will tell you a little later. This is the, this is the uh, wallet in which they, they carried it all the time. So, um, and did the, I'm, did Mr. Morris have any family or friends that were who were in the service or doing war work? He, his, his brother was a, a year or two older than he was, and his brother had gone to the Navy. And uh, his name was Walter Aubrey Morris. But when, when my husband Hugh was a little boy, he couldn't say Walter Aubrey. It sounded something like Bobby. And so they always called his big brother, Bob. So, um, he just passed away a, a year or so ago, too. He, he died after, after Hugh died. And uh, they, they were always competitors all their life. They were very close, but they were uh, just competing with one another all the time. You'd think they were enemies, but they weren't. <laughs> uh, there's a really kind of a funny story about that. When Hugh's son was married recently in Bethesda, Maryland, he had taken Uncle Bob over to West Point, and Bob tripped over a curbstone, and he fell and got a crack in his hip or his pelvis, and so he had to go to the wedding in a wheelchair. And guess who pushed him? Hugh got to push him into the church. And so we kidded him. We said, this is the only time in your life you ever got to push your big brother around. Could you tell me, how did your husband, how did Mr. Morris entertain himself as a diversion from the war? Oh, not just a diversion of the war. <laughs> Before and after, and all his life, he just read constantly. That was his uh, his occupation. He loved to read. He was quite a historian. He did a lot of history work around here on a, a project about the old Beulah settlement. And uh, uh, he was a Civil War buff. He knew every battle of the Civil War and when it occurred. And uh, and during the war, the, uh, he, he, he smoked and smoked pipes and cigars and everything, mostly pipes. Uh, maybe I, I could show you a little picture about that. Well, let's start a little bit sooner than that. This is what he looked like as a seaman. And on this picture, we have his father and also his grandfather. Looks like a common old seaman on this one. Then, he looked more like this a little later. But this is my very favorite picture. It will show, it will show him with his pipe. So, showing pictures. This is the, eventually the handsome man he turned out to be in his later years. So, uh, well, he, he 
played cards with some of the other fellows, and he uh, he naturally wrote letters to his mother and his brother and his father. And um, the, the, another little funny story I might tell you uh, that occupied his time. When they'd go into a port, the captain of the ship would invariably go have a drink somewhere. And they were always worried, always worried that the captain wouldn't get back to the ship before they start to sail again. Not sail, but I guess they, they use that term. It was a, the Liberty ships used steam. But before they would steam out of a port, they had to have that captain on board. And Hugh was the one to go canvas the bars and locate the captain and get his arm and get him back to the ship before he missed the boat. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> What, what exactly did the Liberty ships do during the war? What were they? They carried mostly supplies to different places. Uh, to support the war? Support, they, they carried troops and, and, yes, to support the war. Uh, they, they carried mostly troops and, and supplies. And they didn't do much fighting. They didn't have, uh, they had some armed guards who were the, the ones who carried rifles, but the merchant marine didn't carry rifles. They simply manned the ship and got the ship where it was going. Um, but they, uh, they had a couple of big guns on it just for a little protection. But Did they sail alone or in convoys? Sometimes in convoys. Uh, sometimes alone. Uh, I think most of the time in convoys because they had no other protection. And what were some of the places to which your husband sailed? Oh, the many places he went. Uh, uh, Murmansk and Archangel are the two that stand out in my mind. But he was in London, Scotland, Cape Town, and, uh, oh, 20 different places. Um, did your did your husband did Mr. Morris ever worry that our side might not win the war? I don't think he ever had any doubts about that. He had great confidence in the U.S. and uh, he never mentioned anything to me that he was ever worried about that. Could you share some of your husband's uh, most memorable experiences or stories from the war? Well. Uh, The, uh, the one that's really unusual, I think, that I would like generations to hear about, when they went to Murmansk, which, as you know, is very close to the Arctic Circle, uh, the ships would freeze, it would get so cold, and they, from the spray on the ship, it would, it would freeze cakes of ice just a foot thick all over the ship. And the one he told about, just, I was amazed. They had a full-size steam engine, a railroad engine, lashed to the deck. And the ice was so heavy on the ship that it would list from one side to the other, and they were in danger of capsizing. So the captain ordered them to get all the axes and hammers and chisels and, and anything they could find to chip off every bit of ice on those ships, anything they could chip off to get any, any of the weight off the ship, you know. Years later, I wondered why he would sit in my living room when it'd be an electrical storm and he wouldn't be a bit afraid. And when I realized what he had gone through, on those ship, those those Liberty ships going to Murmansk. How harrowing it must have been to go to bed and know that, that ship was half covered with ice, and they might go over any time and get dumped in the drink. You know, I just I just couldn't imagine it. Did your husband have uh, a particularly humorous experience during the war? <laughs> well, there was one that he told several times. Uh, they picked up three women from a life raft. They were refugees. They had babushkas on their heads and they had boots on their feet. 
They had no stockings. They had straw stuffed in their boots to try to keep their feet warm. But here they were floating out in the middle of some ocean. And they rescued them and brought them on the ship. And to his amazement, they found the one was very pregnant. She was due to deliver any time. And he was the closest thing to the doctor on the ship. So <laughs> it, he wasn't afraid of storms, but he, he was a little afraid of that experience. So he, he went to the ship's library and garnered all the information he could find and read everything he could gobble down to try to find out what he should do. And of course, the men were having a great time with this. They would, they would knock on his cabin door all hours of the night. And many times they came to him and said, OK, Doc, she's ready. Hurry up, Doc. And he'd get all dressed and hurry out. And they'd find out they were just pulling a joke on him. So. Um, I, I believe you have a drawing that one of the men had made. Yes, yes I do. This is this is uh, this is one that the one of the men made, and on this, well, I, I didn't say anything. I didn't remember to tell you. He didn't have to deliver the baby. They finally got the woman to port before it happened, and on this drawing, there's a little comment that says. Since the refugees left, business has been very bad. So he went back to giving shots and things. So here he is chasing one of the seamen. And you can see his medicine chest on the one side. You can see the hypodermic needle. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very good drawing. I don't really know who did this. One of his one of his shipmates did. And of course, he kept this all those years. Very well done. So, um, After the war, did your did your husband, did Mr. Morris, uh, keep the same job that he had during the war? Well, no, he didn't go to being a doctor or anything. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he was very good with people. He became a salesman. He he was a very good salesman. Um, he lived in Catonsville, Maryland, for about twenty eight years, and uh, of course, I didn't know him at that time. But uh, he sold dial soap, and he sold large trucks, and he sold forklifts, and then he was in the in the dry cleaning business at one point. So uh, it, was, it was all people oriented. He liked working with people. And when I he moved back to Evansburg, it was a little a little difficult at that age to try to find a, a regular job. You know. So he went to doing projects with history and things of that sort. He was a uh, uh, public relations man for the, the local playhouse at that time. Um, did, did your husband uh, visit any memorials or participate in any commemorations of World War II after the war? Yes, there's one outstanding one. Uh, the uh, people of Russia were very grateful for the supplies that the Liberty ships brought up to Murmansk when the, German, when the Germans were bombing there. Uh, that's where they would have taken that, that uh, steam engine. And so they decided, even though it was 40 years later after the Cold War and so forth and lack of communication, they decided they should give an award to these men who risked their lives, and many lost their lives taking these ships up there. But they they called uh, the the merchant marine men who were remaining. Uh, they called them to Baltimore, and uh, they gave them this beautiful medal. He was very proud of this. And this medal was awarded by? It was uh, awarded by the Russian Federation. Uh, there's a, a card that goes with it. 
A little citation that is signed by Boris Yeltsin. And uh, they, uh, they awarded this on the last remaining Liberty ship, the John W. Brown. And I had the honor of being on that ship. And uh, I, uh, I took some pictures on that ship. Uh, this, the interesting part of it is, when we got on the ship, Hugh said, I want you to see the cabin where I was a lieutenant. This was my, this was my home. And I took a picture of him in the cabin on that ship. And when I came home, I found a picture of him when he was very young, in that same type of cabin, laying there on the, on the bunk, reading his book. And here he is, with a little lavatory there. Very same type of cabin, so we just felt as though we were on the ship that he had sailed on. And the guys treated me very nicely on that ship that day. I, I, I love that uh, experience. Uh, they wanted me to climb down into the bowels of the ship and see all the big boilers down there. And of course, the ladder was straight down, and I had on heels, and no way he was going to let me go down in there. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would like to, to talk about or to share with us? Well, concerning I, your your husband's service. Uh, well, um, I just wanted to say that he was very proud of his service, uh, and uh, I was very proud when I met him that he was a Navy man because my own brother was a Navy man, uh, not a high-ranking one. He was just a seaman, but. Uh, Hugh's son went into the army, and he didn't say anything about that. Here's a picture of John L. He was in Vietnam. He flew helicopters. This is his but, son. Yeah, this is his son. So when he was discharged from this, guess what he did? He joined the Navy. Now, he's a captain in the Navy. In, in about two years, he will retire from the Navy. So, you see, we, we were Navy all through. Brother, older brother Bob, my brother Bill, and John L. and Hugh, all Navy men. So. I, on behalf of the Veterans History Project, um, the Cambria County Area Community College Library, and all Americans, I would like to thank you, Mr. Mar Mrs. Morris, and also thank your husband for his service.